Well, what a, what a treat to see you all this evening and what a wonderful group of folks for what I, I hope will be an absolutely wonderful evening. If it is not wonderful, it's not because of the round table and the film, which are spectacular, it's because of my own personal failures. Um, I am John Carr. I'd like to welcome you to this year's Nancy Hillier Memorial Lecture, which is sponsored by uh, Bayside Council and the School of Humanities and Languages and the Environment and Society Group at University of New South Wales. Um, I'd like to start this evening by acknowledging that we're meeting today on unceded Aboriginal lands. Uh, I pay my respect to the Bidjigal and Gadigal people who are the custodians of this land. And I'd like to pay our respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. A and in particular this evening, I'd like to pay my respects through this lecture and through our discussion by really thinking through what it means to be connected to country, connected to environment, and connected to the kinds of care for country and care for community that allows people to make a home and a life worth living on country. Um, I'm a senior lecturer with the Environment Society Group at UNSW. My name is John Carr. I will be the facilitator for this evening. Um, so, as you might have guessed by the title, the Nancy Hillier Memorial Lecture, uh, this series was designed to honor the work of Sydney's, one of Sydney's most passionate and devoted environmental and social activists, Nancy Hillier. Uh, this is the 10th year since Nancy's passing, which seems to be a really fitting moment to think about her legacy, her impact on botany, and the meaning of the work that she did. Uh, but from what I've heard about Nancy, and I never had the opportunity to meet her, um, what I've been told is that she wasn't necessarily particularly interested in her legacy. Uh, rather, she was interested in what's coming up, what the future held, what's going to happen next. And so when talking to the Hillier family and Bayside Council, we realized the best way to do justice for Nancy's legacy and her memory would be to talk about what still needs to be done and what can be done to protect the environment and foster those communities both in Botany and Sydney and beyond. So tonight is going to be very much about what we can learn about the future and where we need to go by looking at the past in order to be effective social and environmental custodians in the future. Um, so one of the things that made this really lovely and easy in many ways is that we have the very good fortune of having a documentary that provides a magnificent insight into the kinds of work that Nancy did, the person she was, and what made her such an effective advocate. And that documentary, which we'll be watching tonight, is called 60,000 Barrels. Uh, beyond the documentary itself, which I think is worth all of us getting together alone to see, uh, one of the things the documentary does is it brings up a lot of really interesting questions and a lot of really interesting directions for how we can build on Nancy's legacy and the legacy of all those people who worked with Nancy. Because of no activist, no advocate, no champion for a neighborhood works alone. So what we're gonna do in a bit is we're gonna watch the documentary together, and then we're gonna have the good fortune to have a panel of folks, each of whom offers a really wonderful perspective on Nancy's work and how we might build on what she's done. So after the documentary, we'll bring our panel up here. We'll have a Q&A style round table. If questions come up to you while we're watching the documentary, good. I'll have a microphone. I'll run around. You can ask your questions. I'll be asking questions. Hopefully, the panelists will ask questions of each other. That would be groovy. Um, in a little bit after the documentary, I'll give everybody a proper introduction. But just so you know what to expect tonight, we have Jane Castle, the filmmaker from tonight, Clive Hillier, Nancy's son, Paul Brown, the writer of the documentary and an environmental activist and artist. Hong Nguyen is here from Bayside Council, the manager of environment and resilience, and Maria Poulos from the highly successful Save the Bay campaign is here as well. So it is a star-studded evening. I'm really, really pleased. And I will allow anybody who wants to claim troublemaker status to claim on their own. I will not label you. So, 
Um, as you watch the documentary, please think about questions that, that come to mind or things you like to hear people talk about. Um, before we watch the documentary, uh, Nancy's son, Clive Hillier, is going to say a few words about his mom's life, and then Dr. Christina Curry, Bayside Council member and longtime supporter of Nancy's work, will welcome you on behalf of Bayside. Clive gets an early introduction. I'm going to do my best to embarrass him. Uh, Clive is a longtime community business member, community member. Um, I never had, as I mentioned, the privilege of meeting Nancy, but Clive and his generosity has done everything he can to teach me about Nancy's botany, making me feel, if not like a native son of this community, at least an adopted son. Um, when I started organizing this, tour, uh, this lecture, Clive took me on a tour of, of botany and really allowed me to see so much of what's going on, what, so much of the history and so much of what still needs to be dealt with. So I felt like I had the privilege of seeing this really essential community through both his eyes and Nancy's eyes. So there's nobody better situated here tonight to talk to you about Nancy's life and work here in botany. Thank you, Clive. Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for coming along tonight. Um, first of all, I know John's done some thank yous, but I'd like, particularly like to thank him and, and his efforts over the past uh, three years now, isn't it, John? You've been running the show and everyone's getting uh, bigger and better. Fabulous job, fabulous job. Also, Jane Castle, our wonderful filmmaker, it's made the, uh, the movie we're going to watch very shortly, 60,000 Barrels. Um, my family lived through most of that and I'll come back to you in a, a few moments to talk a bit about Orica back in the day. Maria Poulos, our local hero with the bay. Great job again. One, wonderful, wonderful work. And Paul Brown, who kicked off the, uh, the lecture series um, for, for before John came on the scene. He was a, a good friend of mum and a, a colleague and a support to her. And I've always been grateful for Paul being there in the background. And also, I don't, uh, Hong Yuen, he's the Manager Environment <clears throat> and Resilience Bayside Council. So he's here to answer any questions on uh, the more technical stuff, I would imagine. <laughs> Okay, my mother Nancy was a career troublemaker. I think the first day she was born, she was probably bossing the nurses around in the maternity ward. Uh, it would have marked her 100th birthday this year and 10 years since her death. And it's amazing how time sort of slips away. I've got the benefit of my 66 years basically living most of that time on and off in the area. And the stories that my mum and dad told me when I was young about what botany was like. For those of you who have some knowledge of the area, you're probably familiar where Orica is these days, and um, it covers a massive, pretty disgraceful looking area. Lots of equipment looks pretty dated and should, be, should have been long gone. Um, before that, there was a dairy farm there that covered that whole site. You know, beautiful, beautiful property, magnificent home, lakes, gardens. Um, and a few things happened that, you know, I won't mention names at the moment, but in the 60s where that all changed all of a sudden. So probably the, the biggest industry we had in that area before then was Kellogg's, which was basically making cornflakes and things like that and didn't cause too many problems, and probably still don't. Mum was never one to ignore things going on in her beloved community. Um, she was involved with the historical trusts, the senior citizens, um, and numerous other small committees. But primarily, she was working on the, the battle. Main battles were uh, with Orica and... Saving Botany Bay. When I was around about oh, 12 or so, Mum started to get more and more involved with the scene. That's when they're starting to talk about developing the port. But before that, Orica was already a horrific polluter. I mean, we'd had our fair share of bad smells and toxic waste in the, in the, in the beautiful ponds in the area from the old wool washers, um, Davis gelatine. Um, you know, and, and, and the tanneries and the like back in the day, but ICI was a whole new ball game. You know, people here occasionally see that flame they set off behind Kellogg's that goes up above the stacks there, and they all have a panic attack. You might see it once a year. We had it day in, day out for hours and hours on end. The, the ash, the soot, and everything else was horrific. I had a, a, I used to breed tropical fish and goldfish. I had a big tank of goldfish in my yard that came out one day, and they were all dead with all this greasy soot on top of the water, just the whole lot. And so what, what were we breathing in at the time? Mum was always a great letter writer and she honed her skills 
starting with Orica and writing to uh, local government, um, state government, uh, trying to stir the pot and get things going, but she suddenly found out that these letters didn't also didn't always create the result that she wanted. There were things that Orica was put under watch for, but nothing much was really done. Then we started to look at the, uh, the dredging of the bay. So our beloved bay, that as a child I used to be able to walk out in the, the salt water where Sir Joseph Banks Park is now, if you go back to where Sir Joseph Banks Hotel is, that park wasn't there. It was water and at low tide you could walk two or three hundred yards out to look towards the middle of the bay. And kids' paradise. And they used to go prawning and fishing and all those sorts of things down there. And that was all going to be sucked up and sand was going to be put somewhere else. The key part of that development was a thing called a coal loader that they were going to build. The, the Sir Joseph Banks Park, as we knew it then, which is basically a paddock full of bindies, it wasn't that crash hot, was going to have a coal loader built on it. We we're going to lose access to the bay. We we're going to lose our swimming spot. We we're going to lose our fishing. And through mums and her um, team of people that she brought together, with lots of campaigning and getting in people's faces and actually you know, taking it right up to the politicians and everyone else, that, that coal loader was never built. So you can thank yourselves next time you go to Sir Joseph Bank Park and walk through there and look at the lovely man-made lake. That used to be salt water. Like that. And you would have had nothing except more industries like around the port at the other end. I noticed when Jane ran the film a little bit earlier and it showed the port quite a few years ago and the, the gas storage tanks down there, there was only a few and it was landscaped and green. What's down there now? There's dozens and dozens and dozens of tanks, shoulder to shoulder. I mean, they've just snuck them in over the years. And these are the things, every day of your life, unless you've got people like Nancy, people just sort of go around, go about their life, and all of a sudden they go, where'd that come from? Well, this can't be good. Too late, it's there. And that's why we need troublemakers. We need to make sure the little guy has someone looking out for them and their, and their um, children to come. The bay was a major issue, and whilst it was being dredged, they were also developing the airport to put the uh, second runway in, and then subsequently the third runway. And that was another major, major battle um, that went on for quite some time. So on one front, we had the port being dredged, the bay's natural habitat being destroyed. And then on the other side of the bay, we had the, the airline, uh, the airstrips coming out towards the port. So it wasn't a good look. And more recently, with La Perouse and the cruising, cruise terminal they wanted to put in there, there was going to be more of it destroyed and such a good result they didn't get to do that. I mean, it just really is. It's just fabulous. I wish Mum was here to personally congratulate you, Maria. So, basically, um, I miss Mum. It's, ten years has gone pretty quickly. Um, these nights are always a good night to get together and I can sort of reminisce over history and what I've seen and what she taught me, what, what went on in the area. But she achieved an awful lot. She was fearless. She's a bloody tough mother. Um, <laughs> amongst other things, but I, I benefit from it. I learnt so much in the process. And all I can say is never be afraid because if you don't say you don't like something, people aren't going to listen to you. Thank you very much for your time. And now I'd like to welcome Christina, Dr. Christina Curry, uh, Bayside Council member and former mayor and a longtime supporter of Nancy's work. Come on up. Good evening, everybody, and, and welcome to our beautiful Botany Town Hall. A lot of history in this town hall, and Nancy was a frequent visitor to the council chambers downstairs, making her voice heard. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the land on which we meet, the land of the Gadigal and Bidjigal, and pay my respect to elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge um, Mayor Bill Saranowski, Councillor Joe Jansen from Bayside Council. We also have with us Mayor Philippa Beach and Councillor Danny Said from Randwick Council as well. And all our wonderful special guests who um, have been spoken about, thank you for being here and sharing. And Clive, always a pleasure um, to hear your stories and your experiences. And um, it's just, I always learn something new. Um, many described, as you did, Nancy Hilly as a troublemaker. Nancy was indeed a troublemaker and a much-loved local hero. I remember growing up in the area, and back in the day, we used to get a paper called The Messenger. <laughs> And the messenger would come once a week, black and white newspaper. And um, there was 
the story, well, there was the articles in there about the advocating that Nancy was doing on different types of things. And um, so it sort of followed, I was, um, you know, followed that journey throughout time. And then I had the pleasure when I was first elected to local government, I had the pleasure of sitting with Nancy one evening and in the mascot um, library actually and um, hearing from her firsthand and just thinking, you know, what an inspiring person. She really led the way and was a ahead of her time. A, um, a, as you said, fearless and an important advocate for an area like botany because botany needed it because of, it was a perfect spot for them to come with, um, you know, all sorts of infrastructure, industry, and um, it wouldn't, it would have been um, a lot, it, it, it would have looked completely different had it not been for the work of Nancy and her supporters and other people in the community. So as we've heard, in 1973, Nancy with a small group of locals were concerned about the impact of industry on botany. So they formed something called the Botany Independent Action Group. In 1976, they opposed the New South Wales government's proposal to dredge Botany Bay and turn it into a deep water port with a coal loader facility. Imagine a coal loader facility right, right there. Um, this was a David and Goliath battle, which the locals led by Nancy won. And, you know, it just shows people power and, and you know, what we've been able to achieve um, in our community as well with, um, no to the incinerator campaigns, no to the cruise ship terminals, where, you know, people power is important and it's vital that community get involved in those battles because we are the ones that protect these areas for future generations. So, but the port did expand, but oil super tankers and coal ships could not berth there. Instead of a dirty coal loader, the locals were rewarded with a slice of green space, which is now Sir Joseph Banks Park. And it is a beautiful park and very loved by um, the locals. So, um, and you know, there continues to be a lot of that environmental work. We, um, we had swan, we've got swans there and um, each year the swans' nests would get attacked by either foxes or dogs or we don't know what. So we thought, well, what can we do um, to stop that from happening? And working um, with a number of groups, and interestingly, New South Wales Ports funded it, um, a local Fix It Sisters group um, built a swan pontoon. And we floated that swan pontoon earlier in the year before nesting season and in partnership um, with students as well from um, Western Sydney University. And it was for frog, uh, turtles, turtles as well as um, swans. And the first year this year, the swans nested on the pontoon and a few weeks ago, five cygnets were born. So, <laughs> It's, um, and, and the community have followed this story and it was interesting. So the swans have now moved around the back of the mill pond, but because all the locals can't see them anymore, I'm getting text messages, Christina, the swans are missing. <laughs> and it's, they're, they're there. So this is, this is the importance of, you know, environment is, is really important and protecting the environment. So, and Nancy's tireless campaigning, that was led to the establishment of um, important things like the Botany Bay Inquiry, re resulting in greater scientific study into the, the ecology of Botany Bay. And in 1985, Nancy was named Botany Council's Citizen of the Year. And in 2006, she was awarded an OAM for her services to conservation and the environment in the Botany Bay area and community. Nancy was a founding member of the Botany Historical Trust, and we've got um, the president here, Rob Hanna, too, and um, some members from the Botany Historical Trust. And that was in 1994, and it's still going today, and the current members are um, continue to work to protect our history. And I know they're always looking for new members, so any locals, um, please see. Rob, put your hand up, president. <laughs> 
And so, and that's, um, and was actually, um, Nancy was actually the president from 2002 to 2011. This group, um, as we said, is, continues to be very active. And then in 2016, um, Botany Council, we really wanted to commemorate Nancy in, in some way. And there was a new uh, residential area that had been created and um, there was some open space there. So um, Hillier Park in Botany was named in honour of her legacy. And um, in 2020, it was changed to Nancy Hillier Park, which we opened. There's a lovely, yes, it, which it should be. Um, and there's a, a plaque there in memory of Nancy and, and speaks to her advo advocating for, for botany. And so um, thank you for all your work, John, and, and the University of New South Wales and Bayside Council of Partner continue to partner to hold this and it's very special to us and, and it's something we're really committed to and I, I know you are too and um, thank you for all your work. And um, Nancy would have not been afraid to stand up and share her wisdom and knowledge on the issues we're covering here tonight. And I'm sure our speakers here tonight will bring similar enthusiasm and passion to the topics we'll be discussing. And I'm also sure we'll have plenty of food for thought tonight I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you. All right, just a couple things before we start the movie. Um, I, there's always thanks, and I do have to thank both Bayside. I would like to thank Botany Historic Trust, which has been a m wonderful partner on this project. Uh, the specific folks from Bayside who've helped as well as Dr. Curry include Bobby Main. Natalie Funston, everything that is slick and glorious and professional in here is because of their efforts. Um, the, the faculty folks are wonderful. I want to thank my colleagues in the Environment Society group who are here. Um, and I would also like to thank the Teaching Resource Center at UNSW uh, for, for helping support this technically. And as a side note, if you loved the food you had tonight, there's a reason. Uh, it came from House of Welcome Catering, which is a non-for-profit, which has been uh, providing training and services to people who are seeking asylum and refugees for over 20 years. They provide employment pathways for its clients. Their stuff is wonderful. So if you do want to have a catering event or you just want to eat a lot of food all at once, please remember House of Welcome. Um, and finally, I want to thank all of you for being curious and engaged enough to come out on a Thursday night for this lecture. I'm so excited about it. So with that, let's see if I can actually get this to work. One of industry's biggest dumping operations got underway quietly at dawn one day last week. On board were drums containing over 7,000 gallons of chemical tar waste. The barge was towed by tug about 20 miles off Sydney. teacher at Crow's Nest School that my mum was moving away, she said, where are you going to live? I said, Matraville. Oh, she said, where's that? I said, just out past Botany. Oh, what are you going there for? And I had the thought, where is my mother taking us to? My dad had just died and he was my he was my hero and it left a very big vacant spot in my life. But Botany, Madrigal helped to fill that place. So I owe, I owe the community and I'm trying to pay it back.
Botany, Australia, a suburb of Sydney where residents and the dirtiest of industries live side by side. Here at the Botany Industrial Park is Orica, the Australian offspring of ICI, one of the world's largest chemical manufacturers. Orica's products include chlorine, chemicals for paints and plastics, and explosives for mining operations. But the successes of ICI and Orica are only part of the story. Gas drifted four to five kilometres across residential Ooh, suburbs, neighbouring the has been the given huge permission to take the chemical giant ICI to court over its mercury spill. Firefighters and police converged on the ICI and plant. We pride ourselves by our safety standards and our safety practices. The five practices. dead are believed to have died instantly as they were working ICI very close. recently to took over the plant at Rhodes in the city's the inner west. Is still mystified as to the cause of the explosion. One of Orica's legacies at its botany site is the world's largest stockpile of hexachlorobenzene waste. 60,000 barrels stored 700 metres from local residents. Now banned, hexachlorobenzene, or HCB, is one of the world's most toxic chemicals. It accumulates in living tissue, persists in the environment, and is suspected of causing human cancer. In the 1950s in Turkey, over 3,000 peasants suffered deformities and skin disease after eating bread made from HCB contaminated grain. And more than 1,000 babies died from drinking HCB contaminated breast milk. This is um, store C, it contains the more recently made material and uh, these drum material that's in over drums that had been uh, corroded from the weather and uh, it's basically all dry crystals of HCB. Orica's HCB was produced in the manufacture of solvents. Each year some of the drums corrode and the HCB has to be redrummed. As yet no acceptable technology exists in Australia for the treatment of HCB. But under a national plan, Oric has been given a deadline to destroy the waste. Orica scientists have assessed 21 technologies and several locations for the destruction of the HCB waste. The company's also been consulting with local residents in response to criticisms they've ignored community concerns. After three years of consultation on how to destroy the waste, Bruce Godding's ready to announce the company's choice of technology. Um, the technology preferred for the project is the GML process offered by AMEC Environmental Asia Pacific. And I have a handout here to just give a brief understanding of what the description of that technology is. In the design, it is proposed to design the plant to be operated at the botany site. I think seeing that you've made this announcement now, it's time to go to the general community and tell them what you propose, especially the part that you intend to, or you hope to, destroy this waste at the botany plant. Nancy, if we chose to announce it here at this meeting. We believe this was the right place to, uh, to uh, make the announcement. We didn't want to do it um, through any other means. Well, when do you intend to have your public meetings? We haven't planned a particular <coughs> public meeting at this stage. Well, I've been awake since 3 o'clock this morning. I uh, was very concerned about the events of the meeting of the uh, review committee last night. I was uh, concerned about the announcement that the waste would be destroyed on site. I didn't expect that. I expected they would announce the process that they were going to use. Well, initially we, we welcomed the announcement because we're just relieved to have Orica make an, a commitment to something that's halfway reasonable. But we did challenge their, um, their trials and the fact that they're, they're up to almost six times over the the recommended guidelines in the management plan for dioxin emissions. Um, anything that starts out at that level in a trial, which is run under best possible situation, you know, 
it's only going to get worse after four or five years of operation and if they're only monitored quarterly, um, then who's to say what's coming out in between when it's not being monitored? Orica plans to spend $70 million building the geomelt plant beside the drum sheds. Here, the HCB will be heated to around 1500 degrees and turned into molten glass. This process also creates toxic gases. And the gases actually come out here, and then there's a hood over the top and the gases get collected and go off to the, to the gas train for final, you know, to, to really make sure we get down to the six nines destruction. Our target's got to be 99.9999%. If we find that too much gas is getting out too quickly, we can actually just slow down the way in which these electrodes go through the melt. The average operator on our site would think this is, this is really uh, very, very simple. We want them to withdraw the statement made at our last meeting that the HCB will be destroyed on the Orica site. We sure. want them to withdraw that statement. We want them to hold public meetings and go to the public and put the case to them and ask them, is it acceptable to them to be destroyed on that site? I don't want to sort of, you know, pretend that we're not, we don't want to have consultation and, and we want to hide from something. I Making mean, a fait accompli announcement is not consultation. I don't care what anybody yeah. says. I mean, you know, we can change the words of that paragraph. It'll help to, to not to try and um, say that we're going to conduct feasibility studies. Never mind feasibility studies. Never mind any of that. You go to the public and say, "We desire to destroy this on site. What do you feel about that? Is it acceptable to you?" Now you'll either get your yes or no. I'm not against the idea. We'll get there. We'll get there, yeah. we, over at Botany side. No. Right. Yes, I hope so. I hope so. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Botany Bay Mayor Ron Haney reiterated, Botany Environment Watch concerns that a highly toxic HCB could devastate a community. Normally we would be relieved that such a decision to destroy the HCB has been taken, but when it comes to Orica and their environmental track record, Suspicion is not relief, is how we look at the decisions he said. That's good. That's good. Good. Well. What? You always get a dry mouth when you're nervous, don't you? It becomes glass. It is no longer a waste. There is no HCB left. Uh, what you're left with is a glass product or, a, or a, a rock similar to this. Currently, there are we've undertaken some crushing trials, and uh, we are getting some further work done on on the compactability of that. But at this stage, there is. Uh, Quite a lot of interest from crushing companies. Companies such as ReadyMix have told us that it's quite acceptable to be used as road base. It will be a uh, unregulated product. It is no longer waste. You're talking about reliability and what's your safety record, what's your failure rate? How many times have you had accidents? Well, I, I guess from an AMEC point of view, we have only had the technology for a uh, as I said, nearly a year that we've owned it. ISV Japan have had no safety incidences. GeoMelt or GeoSafe Corporation, who are the originators of the technology, have had no incidences with injuries. So no, no failures, no accidents? No accidents, no. The GeoSafe procedure was used at Maralinga to treat the nuclear waste why was that treatment aborted after only five months? Why was Guttridge, Haskins and Davies critical of this procedure and has it said the treatment was not living up to expectations 
and that GML was unable to manage the project. There was an explanation given about an explosion that occurred, but little attention was paid to it. No inquiry was held into this important change of events. Why? I think there's a lot of questions not answered. It seemed to me that uh, GML was just pushed aside at some time or other. And, uh, G, H and D were the ones who decided to bury the waste. I, I know G, H and D. I've had experience with them over the years. I know. And there is a report uh, called the Pit 17 report, mm -hmm. which is the pit in which, in which there was the, the eruption of the melt. It's an interesting exercise all on its own. It is, and it's one that we all have to know about and we have to learn to see it doesn't happen again. Oh, I don't disagree. I don't in disagree this report I have, they said that they, the time was nearly expired and the budget was just about. Mm. Budget? Yeah. It all boils down to budget. They, unfortunately. My pleasure. You're a toy to play. <laughs> Is he Don't you either? come it to my <laughs> job, I'll, I'll Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> he gave it to me and he said hit Bruce with it. <laughs> 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 It's a very yeah. surprising suburb, but you don't know what's here until you actually come here. We get the big flame, the huge, big roaring. Um, oh, you can see it in the distance. You know, it looks yeah. like a huge, big Bunsen burner, and that's. I mean, that's a bit scary because it's really noisy and it's really loud and it really lights up the sky. And you think to yourself, what what's the hell is going in the atmosphere when you see that happening? Apart from that, we don't, we don't really get affected by by that. No. If you don't visually see it, uh, this is apathy on our part I'd say, <laughs> what, you if you don't it, see yeah. it and it doesn't affect you directly then... Out of sight, out of yeah, mind. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it doesn't affect us. <laughs> Unless it affects no, me directly, no. I'm quite happy living in number yeah. 10 Albert Street and minding my own business. I'm sort of worried about the kids to make sure that whatever goes on up there is done the right way because um, the kids have got their whole lives to go and I'd hate to sort of see anything go wrong up there and affect them in their lives sort of further up. So if everything down there sort of goes according to plan and goes well, we'll be a lot happier down here because we are so close to it. So I'll probably get in touch with Nancy if I can and try and push for a lot more local residents to get down there and get involved, which would be good. contest we have on the site is to try and work more than 50 days without injury on the site and every time we succeed in that we plant a tree. We now have 10 of them so we've actually reached 50 days on 10 occasions without injury. Uh, the best ever we got to is 80 but uh, um, un unfortunately uh, yesterday we had an injury so our current performance is one day so we are started again. Thanks. So this, this uh, store in front of us will actually be the store that we'll use as the feed store for the process. So in fact, the plant uh, will be directly in front of us uh, now. Coincidentally, this is a, a fairly good location that we are 700 metres from Denison Street, we're 700 metres from Brighton Street, and 700 metres from Holloway Street. So it is a, a good location in that respect of distance away from it.
that see they've got us this way they say well if we don't destroy it it's just as dangerous staying there you're saying leave it there well we're not saying we can't say leave it there see it's it's a dreadful dilemma that we're all facing it really is what we will be saying is that all avenues have to be explored export of the stuff transport to another state all those things have to be thoroughly examined and spelled out in the EIS and we want to see their research into these things and we want to see the reason why they haven't opted for those things. ORIC has employed a leading scientific and engineering consulting firm to write an environmental impact statement. They've got this huge abatement system, you know, one of the best I've ever seen. You've got filters and then you've got a thermal oxidizer, then you've got a scrubbing system and then a double carbon bed absorption unit. So it's like, great. And then there's two of them. So in actual fact, the emissions are pretty minimal, but um, trying to get that through all the detail and, and actually making something usable that's presentable to, to you know, Joe Public, who <laughs> sort of says oh, it's all magic, or trying to make it understandable and look um, look good as well, which is kind of important, because if it doesn't look good, no one's going to look at it and, and even try to understand it. So that's what I do, which sounds really boring, but it's actually really interesting. So what we, what we use in this particular instance is um, a model called Ausplume. This isn't this job, this is another job. So it's quite a good visual representation of what we're calculating downwind. It isn't visible in reality, it's, also, it's just a visual tool, but in reality you don't see anything, you'd never see anything, it's all just calculations right. and sort of hypothetical really. It just depends on the parameters you set to how you represent it, so, hmm. One of the major concerns the community has that in a typical, uh, well in years gone by, the EIS process on getting information out and making sure it reaches the right audience has been somewhat inadequate in their view. So what we did was agree that um, if they, that was a genuine concern, that we needed to address that and address it so that all parties were comfortable and took ownership in what was going to be what the plan was. At the moment, there is there are some claims that um, the community doesn't know that this is happening, and we want to ensure that that can't be rifled right. back. Well, would it be fair to say that that overall concern is to do with human health, like or the health of the community? Yeah, it's a, a real or perceived threat of having such a facility in there. And perceptions, you know, it, it's a real risk. If, it, if someone perceives it's a risk, they believe it's a risk, even if it isn't, according to your air studies. So we have to ensure that every opportunity has been given for people to make their own informed decisions. Usually in an EIS they say, we looked at this alternative and it was unsuitable. That's, that's in. We want to see their full investigation and the result oh, of those right. alternatives. That be so we yeah. don't want to see any cost cutting on the safety measures there. There must be no cost cutting whatsoever. I want to know if the vitrified rock is going to be stockpiled at some time or other. You know, if they're going to make yeah. it. They've got 20 employees, they say. I want to know if they're going to get regular respite away mm. from what they're doing. Mm. Now, they're going to have clean clothes every day. So that's 20 sets of clean days, clean clothes each day for 330 days a year. For one person for four years, that's 1,320 what? sets of clothing. For 20 people, it's 26,400 sets of uh, clothing. So what are we going to do? Are we going to store it or are we going to dispose of it as it occurs? No, but no, I just no, want no, you to no. know it's, not going, to, it's not going to fall flat because we've got nothing to say. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to know the contingency plan should GML be a complete failure. Now, pickets for the dog, radio for the dog. You mind the house for me? You're very hot. I don't like to leave the fan on in case there's a fire or something. There's your ball. There's your bickies. You be a good boy. Won't be long. <laughs> I'll say silly old bugger, she's in a day <laughs> I'm not. That's the Botany Fire Station. We've got a heritage order on that. This is the Botany Post Office. We've got a heritage order on it. This is the front of the Botany Town Hall. We have a heritage order on that. 
Hi, how are you? Good, thanks, how are you? Thank you. Hi. Hello. I suppose we should start at the start. Perhaps if I ask you if you've got any comments with the first section of it, under those categories broadly, if you could start collecting names and addresses of community centres and um, all under, oh, I don't know what those, don't know what those groups are now, but the... Um, I think it's more Orica's role to actually collect the data and the community to sort of review it. I don't know whether they'll have time to, you know, basically check it out to phone the phone. Why don't we suggest that everyone puts the level of information they can together with the level of time they've got, mm. and then it's up to us to decide how we fill in the gaps. Yeah. We're going to need a lot of help from you because basically it's, it's Bruce and I at the moment, and I'm going away, and, you know, to be honest, it is like I'm working on a whole lot of other projects and I've been at work recently till you know, 10 and 11 o'clock at night, which I'm not paid for, but I'm happy to do it. That's fine, but I think it's going to have to be a completely cooperative effort and I don't think it's about people saying, well, that's Orica's role. And it is Orica's role to communicate yes, with is. the public, so we're, we're here in our own yes, time as well. Yes, it's our role, but probably we would say, OK, well, we haven't got the resources to do that, so we can only do it to a certain level. Now, we're doing a much, much bigger project than we would have otherwise. Um, and we really would like to achieve it, but if everybody in this group wants it to be achievable, then, you know. We're not begrudging working as volunteers, but we're not, not only volunteer to this committee, we're volunteering on other committees. Now, we will do our best. I know that you're all volunteers, but to, to do this at this level, we're all going to have to be volunteers because we're all going to have to work outside of hours. The way she spoke, it was just as if we were a lazy lot of things, you know. And, but it's Orica's job to do this. Orica has been directed by a government department to do this. Now, if she's the public relations officer, she should know those things. <laughs> what does she know about hazardous waste? I caught her looking at me several times. And I looked up and stared at her until she lowered her eyes. The community has a lot of energy and um, probably a bit more energy than I've encountered before. I think you always get um, a couple of activists, but largely there's a lot of um, apathy. You know, if it's not next door or across the road, then I'm really not that interested. He's old and I thought he was. All politicians have got <laughs> We have made uh, a lot of mistakes in, in the way in which we've managed our natural resources. In many ways, in Australia, a unique natural resource uh, base. Uh, we would like to think that we have learned from those mistakes and that we are committed uh, to do better in the future. Uh, your hard work will be appreciated by future generations really is worthwhile. Thank you. You're not going to go and talk to you? Where is he? He's gone. Mm. He's being interviewed just around the corner. No, I don't think no, I outside. should. See the door? Yeah. He's just talking to the man in the blue shirt. No, 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 no. I've got quite a lot of native grasses and contacts and persecuted. It recognises the birthplace of modern Australia. And that would have a devastating effect on the largest of the plants in the region. Oh, no. 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 Money's been spent efficiently and compatibly. Hello. <laughs> yes, it was, it was interesting that HCB. That's a hexachlorobenzene at Orica. Your base uh, has to be destroyed by the GML procedure. Yeah. The residents, we have to ensure that the job is going to be done properly. I remember the issue. I don't remember all of the details. Well, we... But, um, um, the only issue I can remember is that thinking that... Um, there needs to be a cost sharing in this this exercise. Well, they have they have engaged their consultants. They've got it all for what they want to do. Yeah. But and they see us just as reviewing, but we're more than that. Mm. 
we are the watchdogs for the community of that. So the EIS is taking place at the moment? The EIS should be launched in May. Are we involved in that one or is that just the state government? Well, you've set up a committee, the national body, so we feel because the national government made that step and it was a good step yeah. to ensure that it is all destroyed, we still feel that you do have an interest in it. You've written to me again and I'll look yes, at it Yes, we have. Thank okay. you very much. Good to see you. I'll say that to him. Could I, Chairman Jenkins from Austin Council, I'm deputy mayor. Yeah. Never be afraid of getting old, Jane. It's lovely. Is it? Yeah. I am what I am. If you don't like it, that's your problem. It's not a problem to me anymore. <laughs> you can say what you want to say. People talk and think that you're not very bright and that you're not listening, and it's surprising the things you can hear. It's good. Sometimes I'll go into a meeting that, that people there haven't seen me before and they think I've come to the wrong place. And I say, what do you want, love? Can I help you? <laughs> I used to say, oh, I'm a member of this committee, I'm this and that. Now I don't explain. I just say, well, just hang around and you'll see what I'm here for. Now it's too limited. And I think it's to Orica's own advantage that nobody is left out that can say we weren't told. The subcommittee is still insisting that there are 20,000 personalised letters go out to those households. And we want more respect paid to the people of this community than what's being paid. It's actually going to be extremely expensive to send out a personalised newsletter. Now, we can expand that to 20,000. But there is a finite budget, as there is with everything, and it may well be that something else has to be sacrificed. Cost is an issue. That's what you're saying? If, of course, and we're, we're a commercial organisation. Cheaper, less no, expensive we're... ways out. No, That's we're not we're looking at that. We're not looking at that. It's just that, as with everything, there's not a bottomless pit. Um, and I think that, you know, everybody does understand that. Oh, I'm and sure we, we want to get the best. Look, Nancy, we want to do the best we can with this communication plan as well. As no, you say, not, it's in our interest. You're not doing the best you can. I've actually spoken to hundreds of people, hundreds, um, in my personal and my, my professional life, and not one single person I have spoken to knew anything about it. So... Uh, so after three years of newslettering, nothing's got, no, yes, gotten through. It doesn't work. So what, what faith can the community have that anything's going to get through in the future? This is where, this is what this dispute and, and anger uh, is about. Green is the is the is the get the boundary. Yeah, but that's you're on the, the ground. Yes, what's yes, what's the boundary the up there? Mine worries the air. Yes, I'm. And I'm the air is the air over. The air is All of it. As long as you're happy to go to public meetings, and I will say we disagreed on the distribution. We disagreed on where the boundaries were. We wanted mascot. But we wanted Daisyville. We, we, we will have newsletters at every public meeting. The, pr the private letter is not the only way. You're prepared for us to get up at the public meetings and you the information. Don't have to, though, no, I will. Why? This is the high point because I will. Because the question will be asked. So, yeah, why the... didn't I live? I live across the road on That's Southern where Cross the Drive. Anger will come from. Why the wasn't areas I? That didn't get the letter. Why wasn't I told but, here? Sorry, my but, council area let's, is mascot. Let's, let's assume we're in mascot. Well, the people on the street are going to say the same Bruce, question. Bruce, Bruce. I mean, sorry. Just, just, listen, just, just hear me. There's got to be a boundary. Just hear, just hear me. No, we are not accepting, that. That. Okay. not accepting that. We're not accepting We don't accept it. Okay. Clearly, what we've now done is we've sent that list, that um, um, disc, off to the printer for the letters to be printed. I mean, it has gone. Exactly what way. have you sent to the printer? A disc with all the names and addresses on it. 
of all those seven so eight thousand. So without the mascot, so what we then so have what to else went to the, what else went to the printer? Well, this well the, the draft okay. letters that we agreed at the meeting for them to print up. Yeah, but I mean, in the communication plan, Bruce was also the agreement was that we would be consulted. We would be shown the final. Shown the final draft that was well, always yeah. there. Well, now yeah. we can show you the final draft. We're yes, going to get it back the, from the printer. The final draft went to everybody, but to where it started from, the committee. No, it it's draft. gone to Duap. It's gone to EPA, and the committee didn't see the final draft. But it seems as if you haven't got enough on your plate. They keep on adding another bit and another bit. I think what the exercise is, they try to tire you out so you'll go away. And they've been trying for a long time. There's nobody there. Are you feeling tired at the moment? I am very tired. I'm very tired. I haven't got the drive that I had when we started these meetings, but I'll bounce back. I usually do, hopeful. I know that the people, um, they come up to me and they say how well I've done and all that, and that's nice to hear. But it would be nice to see more action from the people. And I think this is what will decide this Orica business, how many oppose it. I don't know, did you see a sign somewhere that said it? It's about um, a facility to destroy some um, waste and um, we'd like to do it at Botany on the site so that it doesn't have to be transported. Can we put one up in your window? Um, I suppose so. of the EIS, the public will have 60 days in which to comment in writing. You know, I get so anxious I turn the corners down because I've got to come back to that page. You know? <laughs> then the State Minister for Planning will decide whether to approve Orica's proposal. OK, well, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to the launch of uh, our uh, project and uh, the release of the EIS. Excuse me, where did ERS get all its information from to do its um, research? Um, in terms of the process, or in terms, well, for the process, we got a lot of information from Orica and from um, AMEC. For the um, existing environment information, AMEC oh, being the makers of the GML um, oh. process. Um, the, who have never destroyed HCB before. That's right. Yes. Yep. Um, and for the existing environment, we used information um, from monitoring from the Orica's site, from the New South Wales EPA and from other um, general information that's available in the area. So you haven't actually done any independent research other than from Orica and the EPA? You've not done any trialling yourself or no. anything like that? No. In order, 
uh, for the EIS to be a document that can be uh, and for modelling to be undertaken to be rigorous, you need at least um, five to ten years' worth of data. And obviously, we've only been working on the, on the project for seven months. So there would be something to be gained if there was more time for experimenting? Definitely, but you'd need probably five years at least mm -hmm. to do that yourself. Thank you. Oh, Nancy. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> if I stood in the garden. Yes, my gap took you certainly. I gave you. Didn't they give me two of the same two, kind? Two, two of the same. Did you? No, I didn't. No, that's right. Thanks. But I can't see how you can do it on the GML process because it hasn't destroyed HCB waste in great quantities like it's going to. Yeah, but you There's no proven data but it, for it. Yeah, okay. No, you're right, definitely, you're right. But if you didn't do that, then we wouldn't have um, any work anywhere in the world because you have to trial these things in order for them to We have right. to kill off people so as others can learn. That what say. That's what you're saying. No, don't That's put what words you're saying. in my mouth. That's what you're don't saying. Don't put words in my mouth. They were already there. That's what. Human life is the cheapest commodity that has Nancy, I live in the that. area. Well, you're going to need some luck, kid. <laughs> I don't think we ever expected them to say, oh, you beaut, um, thanks for doing it in our suburb. <laughs> no, no that expected. would have been a bit unrealistic, wouldn't it? <laughs> we hope they will become a little more understanding as the project continues, but maybe uh, they won't because they feel that it's their role to actually oppose it right to the, to the very end. Bruce sent me a, a wedding present of it in the mail. He did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> and he wrote on the card, uh, what did you write on the card? You certainly won't get two of these. <laughs> Is there any other plant along those lines? This process has been used in the United is there States. Another plant? Is there yes, another plant? this plant. There are plants in the United States. Uh, is there any other plant in an, in an area such as this, with this type of population? Yeah, there's um, a plant that was uh, operated in in Kobe in Japan. The uh, facility in Japan that what was didn't destroy HCV waste, and it was a kilometre away from a residential area, and then it was mainly industry. I oh, know, I mean, so we're, we're talking about 700 metres. I mean, it's... it's Your firm was paid by Orica? URS were commissioned through a tendering process, a competitive tendering process, and yes, we don't do our job for nothing. Can you guarantee me, as a citizen, that we're not going to have any fallout or that the wind's going to go certain ways and it's not going to affect us. The government requires these types of facilities or any industrial development of this nature now has to have a human health risk study and I went through a, an overview of that. Because of it's about cost. I can tell you that it's about cost. It's not about human, it's about nothing, it's about cost. How much are they going to save? to do the things there instead of somewhere else. One alternative is, is, uh, is in the EIS was to do it in Quinana, and that did include a cost to transport. The cost difference was not significant. What monitoring was on this model? Was it a computer, computer model or was it a, uh, an actual physical model? The model that's required to be used is dictated by the EPA. That model is called Ausplume and it is a computer model. As an engineer, I used to play around with these models and uh, to get the right answer, you play around with the parameters and then yeah, you got the right answer. And now, not many of you maybe read Australian, but, but well, it happens to be that I did. This is the business section. What I suggest for you, sir, to have a look, it's at the moment you have employed a new general manager who used to be in ANZ banking, general manager. The company at the moment in a deep sheet. <laughs> cannot guarantee or predict how can you rectify another 80 or 100 million dollars to build the plant here. I cannot rectify that. How could you, how could you say to your shareholders, hold on, we need to use another 1 million dollars 
to choke all the residents. I just can't, I just can't see that. $185 million loss for the last financial year. Would the Orica representative care to comment on the financial position of, of Orica? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not a member of the board and I can't comment on where the board's going with strategy and issues. Um, as an employee, we're told things will continue um, and you know, the strategy will remain as is. But I'm sorry, I'm not part of that group and um, I'm involved in the HCB project. Chemical company Orica has sacked nearly 300 workers from its head office in Melbourne. Employees were given the bad news this morning. Well, it's expected, so it's not much we can do. The company says the job losses were inevitable. Uh, Orica has gone through a very difficult period. Our performance has been unsatisfactory and it would have been irresponsible of us to continue as we were. Petition for me, please. Garbage. 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 They should make the fines a lot stiffer, like a couple of million, and then we'll. Yeah, I agree with him there. Have you counted how many names you've got there? There's 20 pages or 15 pages. Well, take a, take a count of how many pro formers and how many names you've got there. Right? You're going to put these together too? Yeah, I think that's fair. Struggling manufacturer Orica announced another 520 job cuts on top of 280 already foreshadowed as the company announced a $193 million loss. There's a lot more money to be made for shareholders, a lot more growth in earnings by being more efficient in the short term than there is by continuing to grow the business. It was the way Nancy had them there. I did it exactly the same. Uh, now you've just, changed it. Just, do you want to <laughs> You're not safe to be let loose with a submission, no, no, you're no, not. No, no, no. Well, what are you no, doing? Because, no, because that's the way it is there. Yeah, we'll no, just this one was on top. Yeah, put that this one on top. Oh, That's so got to hit them in the face. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as much as we've written... We've probably missed hundreds of things. No, not hundreds, but no. we, we we could still find more. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thanks, See Beth. You. See you, Beth. I'm just going to take it in, drop it upstairs and go. Don't forget to get um, a receipt for them. For an EIS, do they come here or around the fire place? Well, look, um, I can pass them on. I need, I need to get a receipt for it. Oh, you need to get a receipt. Yep. Oh, best to go to the um, fire place. So that's around the point? Yes, that's Thank right. you. Okay. Where's the bloody... 
Um, submissions. Um, where do we want? Where are they? Um, okay. So that's uh, two, one, four, zero. Yeah, my name is Richard Smolenski. I'm from the Community Participation Review Committee on HCB uh, Waste Submission. I've got three submissions here. I want to get them uh, handed over and get a receipt for them. No, I'm outside your door. I was told by the, by the people down the lobby to come to 19. Are they on this floor or downstairs? Hello. Yeah. You're waiting. Oh, yeah. That's from the film company. It's about two years' time ago. It'll come out. <laughs> um, Sorry? Um, I need to find someone to accept the submissions on the HCB. That's probably fine, but I don't know about any kind of um, okay. filming. Have you got anyone's permission to do that? When I speak in public, my heart beats like a great big drum. My foot used to tap like that, but it doesn't now. <laughs> I, like, I like what I do. I like what I do, but I wish I didn't have to do it. Because then if you didn't have to do it, well, things would be getting down the way they should be doing. It's all about money. That's what it's all about. Our next big fight is to save this beach. Yeah. They plan to expand the port out into the bay and then swing around to take up the greatest part of the beach. So if you hear of a fight for the beach at Botany, you get into it. I'll be down here. I hope so. We'll start with Jane. Thank you so much. So Jane, in addition to being the filmmaker for 60,000 Barrels, um, worked as a filmographer for, for Greenpeace. She's worked as the senior campaigner at Total Environment Center, campaigning on energy and waste. Um, she's done a bunch of awesome environmental work. She sat on the Envi Australian Energy Market Commission's Stakeholder Advisory Committee for its demand side participation review. 
And she continues to do magnificent work as a filmmaker. Um, I'm going to make a blatant pitch right now. Um, if you have uh, access to Stan or Vimeo, Jane just came out with a glorious, oh, come on up, y'all, don't be, don't be shy. Jane, Jane just came, um, came out with the most beautiful documentary called When the Camera Stopped Rolling. Um, it documents her life growing up with her mother, Lilius Fraser, who was the, the first female Australian documentary, documentarian. Um, and it tells her mother's story, it tells her story coming, uh, growing up and emerging as an artist who did a ton of incredible work. She's been a cinematographer on a ton of music videos and films. She's a director. Um, and, okay, I'm going a little off script here. I beg you, see when the camera stopped rolling. It is a manifestation of everything good that a documentary can be. It is beautiful and heartfelt and personal and universal, and it's just a gorgeous piece of art. So, Jane, thank you for being here tonight. So say we all. Uh, thankfully, sitting next to her is Paul Brown, who wrote 60,000 Barrels. In addition to being an honorary associate professor at UNSW, he's the founder of the Nancy Hillier Memorial Lecture Series and the person who I'm always worried I will disappoint. For over 30 years, Paul has successfully integrated university research and teaching and leadership with arts practice, community engagement, and consultancy. He's done environmental issues in theater and film production and communications are all central to his practitioner and academic interests. Um, he's written plays and films. He's the author of Aftershocks, which is verbatim theater about the Newcastle earthquake. He co-founded Urban Theater Projects in 1980. I'm so delighted to have you here, Paul. Thanks so much. Um, just because it's the order of my script. Maria Poulos, who we mentioned before, uh, spokesperson for the S successful Save the Bay Coalition. She has done so much incredible work in so many dimensions, uh, fighting other developments that threaten the public health, environment, culture of Sydney's southeast. Uh, she's fight, fought chemical contamination in Botany Bay, the proposal for a waste incinerator at Matraville, and the massive residential development at Pagewood. Um, her website actually says that uh, she's a career force foreign service officer, but don't hold that against her. She's magnificent. Thank you so much for joining us, Maria. Uh, and finally, I want to introduce uh, Hong Nguyen, who is the manager of environment and resilience for Bayside Council. He holds a PhD and a master's degree in material engineering, majoring in life cycle assessment of materials, products, and services from the University of Tokyo, Japan and he works in local government focusing on development and implementation of environmental sustainable strategies and policies. Thank you for coming and sitting in the hot seat tonight, Hong. So good to have you. So, okay, everybody's gonna have a chance to ask some questions. I'm gonna take the prerogative of being the organizer and ask a couple questions as we go of our panel. Um, I'm gonna start with Jane. Um, so, one of the things I would love to hear, Jane, is how you got connected to Nancy and how being involved with Nancy Hillier impacted your life and your career? Mm, great question. So I can blame Paul Brown for introducing me to Nancy. Um, I was a student of Paul's at UNSW, and um, I don't know, we just got to talking one day about HCB, and I was also doing creative arts at College of Fine Arts, and... Um, there had been, Paul told me about these ideas to make a sculpture out of the vitreous rock that was going to be created from the HCB. And in fact, one of Paul's colleagues, colleagues suggested it should be a monument to man's stupidity. So that really got me excited and Paul invited me to one of the committee meetings and I got there with this idea to, okay, what can I do with this vitreous rock? And then I saw Nancy and I'm like, oh, this is a film. This woman is amazing. And so I roped Paul in and Paul's partner, Christine, and the three of us started to basically pitch this idea. We, got, um, we went to SBS, we got a pre-sale, we got some funding. And then for the next couple of years um, or more, um, I just basically followed Nancy around with a camera. 
um, while Paul kind of kept writing the script, trying to keep, keep up with the whole process and feeding research. And, and also Paul gave us access to Orica, to the community, because you can see there's a lot of behind the scenes um, camera work there. But yeah, Nancy was a huge influence on me and um, she basically inspired me to become an environmental campaigner. Like I wanted to be, I want, actually wanted to have a voice, I wanted to come out from behind the camera and to have more kind of agency in the world. So I did, I became an environment, I actually, yeah, became an environmental campaigner and worked at Total Environment Centre for eight years. So yeah, and the story goes on from there. So Nancy had a very big impact on me as you know, she's a very um, convincing person. Very compelling, awesome, yeah. thank you. Um, Paul, I, I wanted to talk a little bit since your path is intersected with, with almost everybody here and certainly with James. One of the things I find fascinating about sort of your practice is how you've combined uh, arts and drama and theater and community and activism. So I'd love to hear sort of a little bit about how you've come up with that combination of, of arts and activism. Yeah, well, that, that's a big question. Um, I've certainly been involved for quite a while in all of those things. Um, I guess before I answer, I just want to uh, make a couple of initial remarks. Um, it's true that I was a, a member of a group of people who founded this lecture, but uh, there were others involved in that, and I just want to reference Matthew Cairns, who's sitting here tonight, who I think was the person who originally said, let's have a Nancy Hillier lecture. I think I'm right about that. He's nodding. So yes, it's, it's been a great pleasure from a, a university point of view to be uh, involved in the making of this, uh, this film, but also uh, th the important thing about uh, the way I got involved is the university was asked in the mid-1990s to play a particular role here in the botany community as a member of the, the community, in fact, and that is to um, help to coordinate and chair the uh, public participation processes that were getting underway, uh, not only around HCB, but around a, a raft of other legacy issues. Groundwater, for example, was and still is a huge issue that Orica has been tackling. And there's always been, well, always since the 1990s, a public participation process involved in that. That's obviously what the film is about and it focuses on HCB. So my interests academically lay in um, the relationship between technology and society. That's the academic field that I uh, have, have studied in. Um, but that leads me to understand the, the politics and to, and to look at how those public participation processes happen. And then if you think about the creative arts for a minute, and especially community arts. So I'd been the founder of a community arts company and in community arts, that is also what you're doing. You're participating in the decision-making processes around issues that relate to your community. So for me, the thread goes through the overarching umbrella of, of public participation and how that's done and how it should be done. That's probably my best go at that question. That's fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so. Maria, I'll put you in the hot seat. Um, as somebody who, to my mind, embodies so many of the, the magnificent qualities uh, of Nancy as an activist, and somebody who's had such an impact in so many different ways, um, I guess sort of thinking about the lessons we learn as we do this, I'd love to hear some thoughts about lessons that you have learned along the way as somebody who has led you know, the always difficult but sometimes gloriously successful public campaigns, and what those lessons are you'd share with, for example, if there are any young, early career uh, environmental change makers in the room who could learn from them. Okay, so first of all, I'll say I was a reluctant activist. I was an accidental activist. I was involved in a group called Responsible Runners Yarrow Bay 
um, and we were involved in cleaning Yarrow Bay Beach. And when the announcement was made that they were going to build a third cruise terminal at Yarrow Bay, um, that they were, uh, they were thinking about Yarrow Bay as the site for a third cruise terminal, uh, something was triggered in me. Um, and um, we turned our, um, our um, group that was, uh, that was cleaning beaches into um, a grassroots advocacy group that then, um, and we called, uh, there were a few people here in the audience that, um, that were actually involved in the very early days of the campaign, Danny Sade and Mel's over there. We, um, we had a first meeting and, um, and we, we found that there, and there was something that Nancy Hillier said in that, in that um, film about owing community. All these people that felt that they owed community, that they lo that loved their community and owed something to the community came to that first meeting and that's how the campaign was born. Now the lesson, the most important lesson in that for me is you've got to involve different um, um, people in the community from different political, uh, across the political spectrum, from different groups, from different sectors, because the, the most successful campaigns are those that are not just grassroots, but that reach out to a lot of people. So from the very beginning, we had um, councillors from all political parties, we had the Aboriginal Land Council, we had the Fishers, we had um, the um, Clubs New South Wales, we had all these different groups. Um, I haven't named them all, there were like, um, there were all these different groups of the community that came together. So first lesson, uh, you know, um, is, is building a coalition. Um, uh, second lesson was never give up. We, <laughs> um, we found that we were just ignored, um, um, called NIMBYs. Um, that's a very, um, that's a, a term everyone knows now, but our response to that was, no, we're not NIMBYs, we're YIMBYs. We say yes to good development, sustainable development, no to nasty developments that destroy our conservation, um, uh, our environment, uh, are bad for, uh, you know, um, like, like Yarrow Bay was a beach that people from all over Sydney come to for recreation and for it's, it's an important community asset. So anything that is um, against community values, that is not sustainable, uh, we, we fight. Um, so we had to make that clear to decision makers all along. We were, um, you know, we were called, you know, like activism is a dirty word, right? The media, Southern, uh, the Daily Telegraph at first um, treated us as, you know, these dirty activists. We had to work with media. We had to build awareness. We had to work, build those media relationships and uh, work on stories that resonated with a broader audience, and that's what we did. We, we had this fantastic campaign called um, uh, Sydney's Most Favourite Beach. The Guardian was running this, um, <laughs> was running a, um, a, a competition for Sydney's Best Beach, uh, sorry, Australia's Best Beach. We did a sub-campaign and we got lots of media coverage about Yarrow Bay and built awareness about what the, the threats that face Yarrow Bay. Um, they're just two lessons. I could keep going, but I don't want to um, take take space from others. Um, keep going. It's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, give us one more. Let's do one more. Encore. One more lesson is um, don't be afraid to. This is um, this is a Nancy Hillier lesson. It's mm. like be a winger. Mm. Know? At first, I was I, I said I was a reluctant and accidental activist, um, and a lot of us, Mel will say the same. I'm sure Danny will say the same. We were a little very polite with the Port Authority. We were like we went to that first meeting like li like sheep, like li little lambs, afraid to say anything. But as the campaign um, progressed, we became feistier. We didn't take no for an answer. We, um, you know, they talk about the ladder of engagement. We started as advocates and we became troublemakers by the end. Um, <laughs> so. Well done, you. Well done. Yeah. Well done, well done indeed. <laughs> yeah. Magnificent. Thank you. And I'm hoping some of our questions from the audience will help draw out some more of those essential lessons. Um, Clive, mm -hmm. so um, I sort of ask you to do a bit of a thought exercise. Um, if Nancy was operating today as a community environmental activist, what do you think the issues happening in botany would capture her imagination the most? Just looking at the, the movie was a great refresher for me just to remember what mum was like in action. I've forgotten how damn good she was. And quite scary on occasions. <laughs> <laughs> you do not want to be on the receiving end, but trust me. Um, I think there's still a lot of the issues still here that were there then, and particularly Oracle, it hasn't gone anywhere. I mean, only in February of this year, there was a, um, they had to release the excess gases from the system over there, and they had the massive flame going out of the, 
uh, the chimney, whatever you want to call it, that's been there for 50 odd years or more than it looks like. It looks like it's about to fall to bits. And then there's a hole blasted out through the side of it. And the fire department went out, they had a look at the guys, said, oh, we're going to shut it all down, it's under control. So the fire department went away. Then the fire department came back again um, because the, the big wooden frame that was supporting it had caught fire and it was starting to disappear. And then they went away and then they came back again when they discovered on the property next to there was a number of semi-trailers with um, significant storage of hydrogen on the back of the, uh, the trailers. Now that's human error and stupidity. That was even allowed in the first place. This is the time bomb we're still living with there. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's, not, it's the pollution, it's the activity. They've scaled down the, I'm sorry, I'm getting off the track a bit here. I'm talking more about things that I hate that I know mum would have hated as well. So maybe I'm not <laughs> off the track completely. Fair enough. Um, you know, if there's, if they're still hiding behind there. They've changed their name. That was the first thing they, they They then subdivided the companies and shoved off the paint and shoved off this and shoved off that. But the core business is still there and its core problems are still there. And guess what the government's still doing? Those HCBs, most of them are still there on the site. They haven't gone anywhere. And mum would be absolutely ropeable, you know? And looking at the guys she dealt with at Orica, Bruce is a pretty decent guy, actually, that she dealt with. And she, she spoke very highly of him. He had a job to do and she understood that. Um, they'd be sparring partners at the meetings, but they're very civil to one another afterwards. And that's the other thing. She can be tough, but she also recognised when a person was doing their job properly. And she soon told them if they weren't. And that's the way she would continue now. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that I take a lot of a lot of hope from is the fact that councils are increasingly engaging proactively with environmental issues and not simply reacting. So I guess, uh, Hong, what, one of the things I would ask you is, as somebody who's working 100% on environmental issues with Bayside, what are the kind of initiatives or projects that you're most excited about undertaking that the council's doing right now? Yes. Um this is the, the new environmental visitor unit been set up recently in the last 16 months. And I'm just come on board for this, for this role. And the most exciting project I'm working right now is create a resilient plan for Bayside Council. So we work with a number of departments looking what the extreme event, event gonna happen to Bayside Council and how to get the community ready to cope with those. So we, we look into how they're gonna thrive, adapt, survive, and try to embed it into the whole council system to ensure that our community ready, our business ready, council ready, if any event happen. It's not only climate change event, it's also other type of event, it could be Terrorism is good pandemic that we recently uh, suffer, uh, like COVID uh, issues. So those events happen, how co our community will get ready to it, how they're going to survive. Um, one example that we're working at the moment is everyone probably heard about the heat wave in Europe recently with the, the uh, Bureau uh, of the uh, Metrology predict that the, the heat wave is going to be here in this summer, what we're going to do with the community to engage the community, how we're going to get them ready. That's what we're working at the moment right now. Um, try to work with, understand what, the, what communities uh, lie out there and how we got them to re get ready for this event happen. So that's the most exciting project that I'm working right now. The other project that we're working is the, the urban forest strategy. We try to increase the tree canopy within Bayside local government area. So we, we have a lot of project out there at the moment. In the last financial year, we'll be able to plant more than 2,000 trees, mature trees, not just like shrub and, and grass. It, over 2,000 trees being planted across the whole Bayside Council. And that's what we try to aim to increase the tree canopy. Thus we reduce a lot of um, impact from the climate change, um, which is the heat island impacts as well as at the health of the communities. And also look into the economic benefit where they reduce the use of energy, um, but through the, the, 
cooling the area um, with the shade of the, the, the natural shade to the community. So that's what we're working at the moment. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. So, so this is what I'd like to do. I have one more question specifically for Paul and Jane. But while I do this, I I'm, I'm, didn't even tell Viv I was going to do this. I have this wonderful assistant, Viv Noyan, who's been helping tonight. I'm, <laughs> you know who's going to be headlining next year. So if you're interested in asking a question of any of our panel members, raise your hand while I ask a question of Paul. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, I ask a question uh, of Paul and Jane. Uh, Viv can go around and get you set up for, for having the next question. So the question I have for the two of you is, what was the life of this documentary? How is it used? Um, what kind of impact did it have? Um, how do you see this particular work having a life after release? Oh yeah, we agreed I'd tackle that. <laughs> it's been it's been very interesting to see how it's been deployed as as a film. Um, it it played a circuit of international film festivals initially, um, won a couple of prizes, and played on SBS television where it was screened about five or six times in its early. History. So the, the timestamp on it, you might have noticed, is 2002. Um, it then went on to draw attention from a wide range of, of interest groups, if you like. Um, and, and looking at it tonight, I realised just how many facets there are to it. I guess at the time we felt we were making a film about public participation specific to an environmental issue. You know, we used to talk about one company, one chemical, one community was what the film was about. But um, it's been taken up by gender studies, not least because of the central character, but also ask this question of yourself. Um, why is it that at that stage, um, it wasn't just Orica, but other large corporations, generally speaking, engaged young women as the key community spokespeople to connect with community. Ask yourself that question, and that's how the film gained an entry into some gender studies. It's of course of interest in legal studies because um, you, can, you can ask another question. In 2002, the film shows the state of play with environmental impact assessment um, and uh, public participation and the relationship between state and local government. How has that progressed over the last 20 years? And it has changed significantly. But that's a trigger question for, for someone interested in local politics, legal studies, uh, the way public participation has evolved. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been deployed in those ways. The Australian Teachers of Media um, put out a, an interesting education package on it back in about 2007, I think. Um, uh, we've used it, of course, at the University of New South Wales uh, for students doing environmental studies courses at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Um, I don't know if this is the moment to say this too, but um, uh, what, what interested me uh, about the film's history and the, the film's implications is actually um, encapsulated in, a, in an incident, let's, let's call it an editing room incident, back in 2001 where Jane and myself and the producer, Christine Sammers, who by the way sends her apology for not being able to get here tonight, um, were having a heated argument about where to end the film and the suggestion arose, well, hang on a minute, we can't actually stop the film right here because as you might have noticed, the end of the film is the minister's decision is pending. Mm. Uh, we, were, so cool. we, were, we, we were going to argue, uh, we were arguing about whether we had to in fact pause the film, keep filming until there was some kind of Basically, solution. I wanted to keep filming forever yeah. and Christine put her foot down and I was not happy. But <laughs> seeing the issues still not resolved, it was actually... Good, good producer well, it, decision. It's true, the issue, the issue is not fully resolved. Um, 
And and can I spend 30 seconds saying what has happened yes. since Do then? Do you think I can stop um, you? <laughs> so straight after the period of the film um, and the commission of inquiry, um, there was another period of consultation triggered by the, the, the minister himself, who at the time was Craig Knowles. Um, and eventually it led to some declarations on the part of Knowles and also um, the Premier that this waste should not be uh, destroyed in a place with such residential presence. That triggered a whole other search, which Origa went through, for somewhere else in New South Wales to put the waste. And it, it examined a number of sites, I don't remember the details. In a way that was a, a precursor, some even said a smokescreen, for doing what has then happened, and that is Orica's proposals to federal government for licences to ship the waste overseas. A total of five European countries were implicated, and between 2007 and present day, um, proposals for, um, I think in order, Germany, uh, Denmark, France, um, and ultimately Finland and Sweden went ahead. The waste is in progressive batches being sent to uh, Finland and Sweden. Five batches have gone and the stockpile is um, significantly depleted, but there is a way to go. Um, so no, there isn't a final, and imagine if we waited until <laughs> 20, years. 20 years to put an ending on the film. Anyway, sorry to take time. No, that was great, that was great. So let's open it up to some questions from our audience members. Um, who has, uh, okay, well, mm -hmm. well, I'll ask you to pass it around after you ask your question. Sure, this is, yeah. Um, thanks for the film and for the panel. It's really interesting discussion. I have a fairly broad question about contrasting that form of activism at that period of history versus what you see today. Um, particularly something that I noticed, and this may just be my ignorance since I wasn't around and don't have more context, but it was really sort of single focus action, um, particularly dedicated to a particular issue. Uh, and as was mentioned before, the importance of that in bringing together sort of a broad, diverse range of communities from political, different political values, et cetera. And um, if I could be so bold as to suggest that activism today has a slightly intersectional tilt with multiple different value systems, um, I'm wondering if you could speak to the degree to which you think that impacts either negatively or positively on action, um, given that it seems to be baked in with a leftist politics or a particular view on economy or a particular environmental sensibility. I think that's Paul. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> uh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, Great question. Look, and I, yeah, so I, I, you're absolutely right. Um, a lot of those actions were very locally based. And I kind of, I'll say that the Save Yarra Bay campaign, and a lot of the other campaigns you see around Botany Bay, uh, they start as local issues and that's what galvanizes the community because a lot of people aren't politically engaged. So the, the way to kind of get people involved in activism um, is to, it, it has to resonate, it has to affect, I, and I think in the documentary there were some women saying, well, I think I'm a bit apathetic because I don't, unless it's happening in front of me, I'm not gonna do anything. And that's what I found that with the Yarra Bay campaign, with the incinerator campaign, Save Little Bay, um, Save Jennifer Street, there are all these different campaigns. It, it started with people that were directly affected um, and then I'll, I'll tell you what happened with the Save Yarra Bay campaign. It was those that were directly affected that used the beach all the time. But then we started through this process, there was a political awakening. People that were never protesting before suddenly were, attending, were, were coming along to protest. They came to this rally that we call Fix New South Wales where we connected with all these different movements from climate movement to um, those that are working on trans, sustainable transport to all these different things. They came together and it was a bit of a political education so these people that had never dealt with these issues suddenly were were um, you know environmentally con uh, environmentally conscious they were they were talking about um, climate advocacy they were you know so so I, I see 
And I'll say something else about um, what, what we saw in that film and, um, and current um, activism. You see a lot of social media warriors. Like a lot of the people in our campaign, I like to boast that we had, we had 15,000 signatures and we had 8,000 8, members of, the, um, of Save um, on our Facebook site. A lot of them weren't active. They would click occasionally, they would like a post, but they weren't really engaged. We had a core group and there's one flipper here who was really active um, and a lot of the Greens and we, um, there, were, there was that core group um, and then I would say 100 foot soldiers and that was basically the, the heart of the campaign. Um, but then we like to tell the government that we had all these other supports. But yeah, social media isn't enough. This is the point I wanted to make from that. It's um, like that sort of activism is, it was really grassroots community oriented um, and we, we lose a lot of that. And I, I'll say that Nancy just wasn't a troublemaker. Yeah. She was the heartbeat of the community, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what we're often missing in activism and um, campaigns today, it's that heartbeat. Super. Anybody else want to? to yes. Um, this is this really much from the local perspective, uh, local government area. We we see that with the community, if you want to change your behavior, you need to create a new norm, and that's when you create a move new movement. And with those movements, especially with Nancy, you got you need a champions in it. When the champions start that movement. A lot of follow we follow, and then once you got that momentum going, it's become bigger and bigger. So that's what I see from local government perspective. So that's why my perspective here, we used to work in a really silo environment when we sit in the office and then doing desktop study, that sort of things. But certainly nowadays, we coming out talking to the business uh, to the community work with the community and try to understand where they come from and try to kind of like create that movement, create that understanding of the issues around it and work with them to resolve those issues. So that's what, that's what I see from the local government perspective. Thank you, thank you. Next question. Um. Because you're talking about canopies and trees. This, especially in, I live in Mascot, I live in a four story uh, new development. Outside my whole apartment, I live in a tree, a huge tree. There's a UK plane tree. It shouldn't have been planted, it's not uh, suitable for our climate, and it's uh, doesn't get a lot of maintenance. I have trouble breathing, so do lots of others around me. It blocks all the drain. In fact, it costs nearly, hmm, I think, $600 a month to clear the drains. <laughs> um, are you going to plant more UK, please? The answer is yes and no. Um, with the, with the uh, study that we do right now, urban forest strategy, we're going to review the list of the suitable trees in different locations with the expert to see what type of tree is suitable for what type of location. It could be street tree, but that street tree is, could be changed from one species to another species. It's in the open space, what type of tree we're gonna uh, plant it there. So the answer is yes and no, it depends on the locations. And we try to review the tree, the species that can cope with the changing in climate as, as well. So in terms of less maintenance in the futures, if anything happens. So that's what we try to review those species. And then it come up with the list that suitable trees in the different locations and that, it compiled into what we call the master street tree planting for at the street level of what type of trees is suitable. We have a hand up in the back and, and after, after you, of course. Oh, no, 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 go ahead. Hi, sorry. Um, thanks to John and the organizers and thanks to the panelists. Um, something that kind of hit me as I was watching the doc documentary is when Nancy was speaking about the fact that she was tired and it got me thinking about mm. what sustains you in activism and particularly those who have worked on campaigns that have had a lot of setbacks 
um, and have taken a long time. I just wonder if anyone could speak to, yeah, what gives you that drive and that sustenance? Spectacular question. I didn't quite. Oh, so, sh so Brittany was saying, what, what gives you that drive to maintain that sort of energy when you're dealing with a long, often challenging campaign, right? Because it's, it is an endurance sport. So what gives us our endurance? Well, I mean, from a personal perspective, Nancy just had this fire in her belly and she had, I think, a really strong sense of justice and injustice. And so I think she inspired all the people around her. And then when I went to work for Total Environment Centre, Jeff Angel, um, who's basically been running the place for 30 years, he was like a pathological optimist, also with a fire in his belly. And I, you know, he really kind of held, because we were all kind of, it's so depressing, you know, just loss after loss after loss. So you kind of hitch your wagon to these very, um, particular people that are very driven and for me you know I think I was just processing a lot of my anger issues because it was so great kind of churning out these media releases and having a sense of empowerment and you know but it's it's time limited I know Paul had an activist phase and you know I kind of burnt myself out after eight years at Total Environment Center and then a few at Greenpeace um, but yeah, when, when you've got the energy and you're young and you've got a sense of justice and, you know, now the situation's just getting more and more dire, um, this, there's a sense of urgency that's also kind of a great motivator. Other thoughts on? Thank you. Uh, I just want to mention, Nancy Hillier founded around about 26 local community groups uh, across a whole range of areas in an era where there wasn't even Meals on Wheels. Everything from radio stations through to environmental activists, etc. I'm stealing Clive's thunder. The other thing... My father built the studio. <laughs> right. The other thing Nancy Hillier did, which is a little bit less known, is archive everything. And it's still there in the local library. Uh, bay after bay after bay of the stories the press clips, everything. Um, so I think she sustained herself by finding the necessary action. And that's one thing I'd say. And it, it's, it's, a, it's an old activist adage, you know, that the optimism of the action is worth 10 times the pessimism of the thought. That's what you have to keep in mind. But um, when, I was, when I was at Greenpeace, um, yeah, things were roundabouts and swings. And I tell you, I'm going through a bit of a crisis now. If you're a Greenpeace campaigner from the early 90s, you're thinking, my God, we failed on climate change. What do you do next? How do you sustain? And, you know, my answer at my age is I listen to the 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds. That's how I try to sustain some kind of balance. Um, but another person who, who I've uh, talked with this talked about this with, um, divides it up into um, research, must do your research. Second, if you find a problem, you must call it out. And thirdly, do yoga or, equi <laughs> or equivalent because you must sustain your actual bodily health in some way. So, yeah, I think that each person will find their own answer, but it mm. does require learning from those who've gone before and, and uh, applying your energies in in directions that will sustain you. you oh, look, I, I think you've said it perfectly, but yeah, it is an endurance sport. So it takes real resilience. And there were many times where we, we were burnt out. You know, we, it was only a three year campaign, but we had moments where we, we just feel we dejected. And, um, and I, I, there was something in what you said that really resonated with me. It is um, like, I now work for ACF and I see a lot of older activists who, you know, they've gone through that cycle of exhaustion. They have to take time out. They come, they go away for a while. They come back, but it's a long game. Um, and if you've got those values and you stay committed to a cause, it might be that you're not as active in a, in a movement for a few years, but you still remain true to a cause. And then you, you hand the baton to the next generation. Now I'm, I'm organizing an event at Parliament House in a couple of weeks where um, we've decided that we're going to give youth the voice. It's a few days before climate strike. 
school strike where we're bringing um, 20 young leaders to Parliament House to be our spokespersons. They're our trusted messengers. Um, and, and, that's, and that's basically our, it's a bit of succession planning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next question, I thought we had a question in the back. Um, yeah, good. I, um, I just wanted to say that I found that uh, documentary very uplifting and inspiring. Um, I just wanted to say that my, from my observations of it, the, the environmental issues were very much driven and fought by the community. Um, potentially that's a, a sign of the times, but I wanted to ask, has that, response, that, that weight of responsibility shifted from the community to local governments now, or is that largely being fought still by local communities? And if it is, should it be? From my perspective, um, we act at the gatekeeper. So we try to um, talk with the community, understand with the, what the community wants, what the visions, and also look from the other perspective. And we, at the local government, at the authority, we make sure that anything ha anything done have to be have to done correctly, legally. And that's where we act. We're not the, the barrier, but we're going to act at the gatekeeper. So anything go through, just like what you said, the good things might happen, the bad thing, we have to stop it. So that's what our performance. Um, in terms of how it shifts from the community to the, lo to the local government, it's really hard. It's the fine line um, boundary between the community and the local government. Um, we have a set of procedure and, and regulation that we have to act on it within that boundary, but we also want to make sure that we understand the need from the community and bring that one back, work within our um, color regulation to make sure the, things, the good things can happen. Um, so there will be a connection between the two. The elected councillors represent the community. So um, as what's happened with many of our campaigns, we will put a resolution to council of either supporting, like we did with the um, Save Yarra Bay. Um, we put a resolution to council, we commit so much to a campaign, we get involved and then council has to act on that resolution. So a lot of it is um, elected um, at local government, working together with our community in order to advocate for things. So, so I think, oh yeah, well, I think we have, oh yeah, please. Make it quick. Um, yeah, just one quick question. For a, um, do you ever envisage a part two as knowing that ICI virtually, you know, they, we know now that they tip mercury down through the sewerage and then we know that they send chemicals out to Botany Bay and we've poisoned the aquifers and yeah. um, just about everyone who's worked there through time has died of cancer. Do you ever think there will be a part two organically or does it take an activist to start it and build it all up again and, and sort of come and start it all over again? Is it different these days, do you think, because of social media that it takes an activist as someone who just goes through social media only? Like the days of Nancy would have been so hard because you had to get um, petitions and you had to knock on doors and go to shopping centres and all the rest of it. But do you think there is that spark or is it just that people now have become humdrum because it was so far in the past that the only people with memories of what was going on would probably be the only ones who would probably take it on, like Cliff or someone. <laughs> I don't want to give you extra work, but, but I noticed there was a lot of things. I would love to. Because there was that time where um, uh, virtually just about everyone in Matraville or Botany worked at ICI. It was the employer of you know, virtually everyone walked around with their jackets of ICI and mm. um, my father, uncles, cousins, neighbours and everyone all worked there and all of them died of cancer and there's never cancers in any of the families that have passed away. So that one day there will be, uh, I'm sure, but I just think it takes someone. Do you guys think that you will take something on as a part two? <laughs> Well, I, was, I was just talking to Paul just after the film saying we have to recut the ending um, to update it at least, you know, 20 years on, mm. most mm. of the barrels That's are still there. Yeah, 
Um, but yeah, the, the whole media landscape has, has changed and it has become quite professionalised and quite sophisticated campaigns like the ones that you, you're running. Um, so it is very different. It's like a different era. And although, you know, it was very, a lot of hard work, you can see the grunt work that got put into it. They actually had quite a, a big impact, you know, mm. like she got the thing stopped, basically. Yeah, yeah. She got to talk to the Federal Minister for the Environment. Um, and now there's, there's kind of a, it's quite diffuse, the social media, the professionalisation, you know, a lot of groups work in alliances now. And that was something that struck me watching the film and remembering Nancy is that she was very wary about being used by big environment groups. Um, and I think yeah. she was pretty like anti-Greenpeace, anti the Greens, you know, like we're just running our own show. And I just think the whole, yeah, it's changed a lot, but we might, I would just think we might need to recut the ending. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back to see that. Tonight. I does anyone want to take them? <laughs> be involved so in the younger two. generation? If there, I'm sure there are some filmmakers out there doing the master of environment management, and um, <laughs> can do it. Yeah, there you go. And it's so. I mean, that is so much easier now. Like, you just have to have an iPhone, right? And you just follow people around. It was a lot. Filmmaking was a lot clunkier back then, and more difficult, and you needed funding, but. You know, now you can just, yeah, make your own films and stick them on YouTube and then, you know, no one watches them, so. I'm <laughs> <laughs> thinking of the advertising. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're, I would be happy staying here all night, but we're getting towards the end of our time. Uh, I'd love to hear one more question, um, if anybody has, a, oh yeah, well, perfect. Sorry. Hey, welcome, good to see you. <laughs> thanks, thanks everyone. Um, I'm curious to find out, and, I, and I'm worried that a lot of corporations are becoming much more sophisticated in the way that they are polluting and they hide behind a corporate veil, and this happened back in the day. What is activism's response to that or doing now, or what are the future trends in response to the sophistication that so many organizations are are doing and you know, where, where do you see where do you see activism responding to that? Um, so yeah, you're right. You're talking about greenwashing and mm. um, the sophisticated way they hide what they do and you know hide behind the label of green and you know it makes it much more complicated. But this is where you I, I think you work um, uh, to expose that uh, you know uh, one like you you can. Uh, work, uh, there's something like a lot of activists are doing, you know, it's working through the financial institution with the banks, through ESG, to ensure there's full disclosure and trying to uh, legislate mandatory climate risk and nature risk disclosure, you know, so that we are, we have that transparency and we know they can't just um, make up, they can't offset their way to, um, mm. you know, and they can't um, hide behind, um, you know, buying international offsets and showing like they could, you know, pollute the environment here, destroy nature there, buy offsets. If we have integrity um, through law and we have transparency and activists actually fight for those sort of changes in the law, um, that's, how, that's, just one, that's just one angle of, of meeting this new challenge. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of other ways we could like we, look, we could also um, look at how we campaign and look at um, uh, sort of you know, using the same instruments and tools they use to counter it, you know, and um, and that's sort of and you see a lot of the may I know you were just talking about major organisations like um, Greenpeace and um, I work for Australian Conservation Foundation and we do things like crowdsourcing and we get lots of people involved in investigations and we get people using satellite imagery to report on what people are doing and and then we. we we use that to kind of, you know, um, put it to the compliance authorities and Department of Environment to do the investigation. As volunteers, we shouldn't be doing that as organisations, mm -hmm. green organisations. It's not really our job, but um, by working in this way, we can actually get governments doing the job of enforcing enforcing environmental laws. And yeah, I mean, that's just one example. There are, lot, there are probably lots of others we could keep talking about it, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, look, uh, the gentleman who left just recently began this thread of conversation, didn't he, when he, when he said that um, contemporary activism is basically it's complex and has many threads and um, they need taking account of. 
Um, is there anything that draws it together? Is there uh, uh, something new that we can think of that would would um, be be some kind of amalgam of, of all of those? I don't think so. I think that there's room right now for e each and every of the strategies of campaigning that we've seen across the last 50 to 70 years since environmental activism really got that big push after World War II when the material problems hit us all in the face. Um, so I, I think, yes, uh, let's have the street demonstrations, let's have the social media work, let's make films, let's do all of that, um, et cetera, et cetera, all the different tools that are now uh, at the, uh, available to us. But I have just today been thinking, how do I feel about coming along to a discussion about troublemaking and activism at this moment in Australia's history. I think, I think there is, an, uh, other things have been exposed over the last three years. What am I talking about? Well, one is COVID, COVID taught us that our understanding of the role of science has shifted. And I think of active, as activists, we, we need to recalibrate exactly how we utilise science and, and, and how we critique it when it needs critiquing. The other thing is that um, the most recent events, especially Australia's referendum, have in some ways put us as, I speak for myself as a progressive activist, it's put me at odds with, and even at war, with the, the sources of misinformation and the organised way in which misinformation has become de rigueur. It's, it's the way that opponents to progressive change are fighting those fights. Mm. And we need to evaluate that, take account of it, and rebuild strategies to counter it. One of the best things that happened over the last two weeks was the pause called for by the Aboriginal leadership. But I think we're in a bigger pause, not just one week, but we're right at a stage at the end of 2023 where the re-evaluation of how activism needs to proceed and how we counter some of those forces that are feeding misinformation into social life and political life. Mm. We need, need re-evaluation. We're in a pause, is what I'm saying. Right, activism is always a shifting terrain, mm -hmm. right? And one of the things that I think the panel speaks to is that like all options need to be on the table. All approaches are essential to explore. Um, and I will editorialize a bit, um, just sort of thinking as we close out. I mean, one of the things that I love about thinking about Nancy's example is one hand, she had this magnificent sense of humor that is unique to her. She had the fire in her belly. But there are think about things about Nancy that we can all adapt. She was willing to read the documents. Mm -hmm. Like that's a superpower we can all develop, oh, yes. right? She saw bull and she called it out. That's something we can all do. She created a community, people who were fired up about her vision. That's something we can all do. She took joy in the people she worked with. So I will say with that, thank you all so much for bringing your joy and community and commitment and humor and the fire in your belly. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Let's do it again next year. Thanks so much, y'all.